wireless protocols? Yeah, it's visible. Okay. So I wanted to add a few points about the trauma, which is not given in both, both, both latest Bailey as well as in latest Zebstran. ATLS revised guidelines, 10th edition update. So I wanted to add a few points alone for the trauma points. I'll just note, uh, I'll just highlight the important extra points you just noted down. So this is as per we told only, one liter of isotonic fluid is for initial approach, whereas for pediatric, it is 20 ml per kg. So aggressive resuscitation, if it is still, it is not unresponsive, you can go in for blood transfusion. So the cutoff, if at all, why I am sharing this? Because they might ask from the recent ATLS guidelines, which is not given in our textbooks. So I'm sharing this. So one liter of fluid for adults and 20 ml per kg for pediatric patients who are, who are less than 40 kg. So in this slide, note it down. And rapid sequence induction has been changed to drug-assisted intubation. That is one change which has uh, been done in the ATLS recent guidelines. So rapid sequence induction to drug-assisted ventilation induction. All this as we have discussed, the degree of shock, everything is the same. So tranexamic acid also is the same only. Same dose, one gram followed by one gram over eight hours. In thoracic trauma, the life-threatening injuries, frail chest has been included, but now in the recent guidelines, the life-threatening injuries, frail chest has gone out, out from the life-threatening injuries into the significant, potentially life-threatening injuries. Whereas the tracheobronchial injury has now been included in life-threatening injuries. That is the only one change which has been done. Please note it down. Flail chest does not come under life threatening injuries as given in Bailey. And tracheobronchial injury has now been added into the life threatening injuries. Uh, about tension pneumothorax, all those guidelines are unchanged. And in aortic rupture management, this might be asked what is the goal heart rate and goal MAP? Blood pressure and heart rate. What is the goal? Our goal or the target is heart rate less than 80 beats per minute and mean arterial pressure less than 60 to 70. You can remember as 60, 70, 80. So 60 to 70 mean arterial pressure, heart rate less than 80 beats per minute. All right. So please take a note of it also. If this is for aortic rupture management, the target heart rate and target mean arterial pressure. And for head injury management, the target systolic is more than 100. Maintain systolic BP at least more than 100 for patients 50 to 60 years, 50 to 70 years. And for younger individuals, you can maintain even at a level of 110 millimeters HG. This is systolic blood pressure. So it has been proved to increase the outcome and decrease the mortality in case of severe head injury. So take a note of this uh, cutoff as well. Systolic more than 100 for older individuals, more than 50, and more than 110 for younger individuals. These guidelines are all the same, no changes. Last, I wanted to add is burns. Coming to burns, whatever Parkland formula is given as 4 ml per kg per point to body weight into percentage of total, bodies, uh, total body surface area burnt. Whereas in thermal injuries, it has been recently updated as for adults, it is 2 ml per kg. Whereas for children, it is 3 ml per kg. And the fluid has to be titrated according to the urine output that has been included. So once you achieve your target urine output, you can reduce your fluid resuscitation. You are not supposed to maintain a constant fluid for all patients. 
So your end point of resuscitation is your urine output in case of burns, thermal injury. So two, three and four. Four is only for electrical injury. So this table, you can just take a photo or you can take a note of it. So please pay attention. Even if it is for scald or flame injury, adults, it is 2 ml RL into body weight in kg into total body surface area burnt. So the target urine output is 0.5 ml per kg per hour. So I repeat adults, 2 ml per kg into the weight in kg into the surface area burnt percentage, the target urine output is 0.5 ml per kg per hour. In children less than 14, 14 years of age, it is 3 ml, just change 2 into 3. And the target urine output should be at least 1 ml per kg per hour. Okay, target ml is, target urine output is 1 ml per kg per hour. Whereas for infants and young children, always add a dextrose containing solution at maintenance fluid because they are deprived of uh, dextrose and glucose metabolism once their metabolism is deranged. So you should always add dextrose for younger children and infants. So that is the only change here. And for electrical injury, all ages, irrespective of the age, you can give a bolus of 4 ml into body weight into percentage total body for total burnt surface area until the urine clears. So once again, the target urine output here is 1 to 1.5 ml per kg per hour. So adults 2, children is 3, infants and young children, you should add a, uh, the extras containing solution. And for electrical injury, irrespective of the age, it is 4. So these are the few points I want to add on to in the trauma section. So we'll move on with burns now. So what is the pathophysiology of burns? We'll go, we'll rush through it quickly. So it causes injury to the airway and lungs mainly, and it causes certain inflammatory and circulatory changes. We'll deal about it later. And it impairs the cell mediated immunity. So burnt individuals are highly susceptible to infections. And not only infection, generalized infection, they're also susceptible to infection at the burn site, lung infection, pneumonia, as well as catheter line infection. So what about intestine? In intestine, it causes typical microvascular changes and gut mucosal changes. What happens is it increases the gut mucosal translocation capability because of the microvascular injury. So what happens? Easily, the bacteria are able to translocate, leading to infection. Not only that, once the mucosal defense breaks down, you will have an increased susceptibility to acid mechanisms. So it will the mucosa will be more prone for injury by acid. So that is why the ulcers we get in burns, it is called as curling ulcer. So it is due to the decreased mucosal defense, but not due to the increased acid secretion. One more, it is it's MCQ oriented. So the question may be asked, why, why there is a curling ulcer occurring in burns individuals? And lastly, it causes danger to the peripheral circulation. So once the peripheral circulation is compromised, what will happen? Even the collagen are totally lost in the extremities. Once the collagen is lost, the elasticity of the skin will be lost. So there will be a tonic effect in the full thickness burns. So that is why it can cause compartment syndrome, which we have to release immediately. So injury to the airway and lungs. So what are the important signs you have to note down if you are suspecting an airway burn? So warning signs of burns are burns around deep burns around the face, neck and the throat history of being trapped in any burning room, change in voice, and presence of strider. So I repeat, history of being trapped in a burning room, history of change in voice or presence of strider. And if you observe any deep burns around the face, neck, and throat, also there will be loss of nasal hair, singing of the nasal hair, and the presence of soot in the oral cavity. All these should point towards the airway burns. Why we are concerned about airway burns? Because we have to uh, decide upon an early intubation for these patients. If you do not intubate these patients early, they will go in going for a glottic edema, proving later intubation very, very difficult. 
So you have to go for other means of providing a surgical array like trichothyroidomy. So to avoid all these unnecessary issues, you look down for early signs of respiratory burns so that you plan for elective intubation at a very starting phase itself to avoid late complications. So this is from Bailey. So inhaled odd gases mainly cause supraglottic airways, airway burns. So I've highlighted, please follow that alone. Heart gases cause supraglottic burns. Steam can cause, uh, it has a large latent heat of evaporation. So it can penetrate up to the subglottis and even up to the alveolar epithelium. What happens here is the steam causes the loss of alveolar epithelium. The injured epithelium can create cast inside the respiratory tree, which causes respiratory obstruction. So steam has a peculiar mechanism of causing respiratory failure. So hot gases, supraglottic, steam, subglottic, smoke particles, they can reach up to the end alveoli also. So because of the chemical alveoli it is resulting, the patient will go in for a respiratory failure. And inhaled poisons, what about carbon monoxide? It is a deadly poison. It can bind to the hemoglobin at very, very 240 times, 240 times more than that of our normal oxygen binding capacity. Carbon monoxide has a 240 times more than that of the oxygen binding capacity because of which it totally shifts the oxygen away from the hemoglobin, thereby reducing the oxygen supply to the periphery. What happens here? If the concentration reaches 60%, confirmed the patient will go in for death. So more than 10% itself, you have to provide adequate 100% oxygen for the patient for at least a period of 24 hours. This is what is given in Bailey. So carbon monoxide poisoning, you should immediately give the patient with 100% oxygen for a period of at least 24 hours. So what about full thickness burns to the chest? They can cause a mechanical blockage, thereby leading on to respiratory failure. So each one of the mechanisms cause a respiratory failure in their own mechanisms. So I repeat, hot gases, supraglottic, steam, subglottic, smoke particles up to the alveoli leading to respiratory failure. Carbon monoxide, metabolic poisoning, it impairs the oxygen delivery at the tissue level itself. Full thickness burns, it's just a mechanical blockage causing a respiratory failure. So this is explained as a mechanism of various, various particles that can cause respiratory burns. So what happens here? Next, we are going on to the inflammatory and circulatory changes. So I have just concised it in here. In the first 36 hours, what happens? There will be a profound circulatory shock. How does it happen? Because the burnt tissue, it activates the complement. It alters the vascular permeability. Alters in the sense it increases the vascular permeability. And by complement activation, there will be a large number of neutrophil infiltration, macrophages, everything. So an inflammatory cascade is set on fire in a burnt individuals. So what happens? The permeability is increasing. So the large proteins will go from the intravascular compartment into the extravascular compartment, that is extracellular space. But initial shift, the proteins can escape, water can escape, but the RBCs would not escape, can be asked as a question. So all the following escape in the burnt individuals from the intravascular to the out extravascular shift, except RBC. So because of this only, the proteins, because the proteins escape, following which the water also escapes, so, so the intravascular compartment is devoid of any fluid leading to profound circulatory shock in the th first 36 hours. It is very, very maximum in the first 36 hours. That is why the fluid resuscitation, everything we focus on first 36 hours in all formulas. So again, the numbers or the figures, please make a note. Everything is important. All the four points is important. So number one, the volume lost is directly proportional to the burnt surface area. That is why we are calculating the resuscitation fluid burn based on the burnt surface area. So that is very evident. Number two, circulatory shock always occurs just when the total burnt surface area approaches just 10 to 15 percent. It may not be more than that also. Just 10 to 15 percent, the patient will go in for severe circulatory shock. So more than 25 percent. The inflammation is so profound that the fluid loss can occur even at the sites remote from the site of burnt injury. So 10 to 15 percent, it starts. 25 percent, even the site remote from the burnt injury can cause fluid loss. And who need IV fluid resuscitation? That is important because you have to uh, decide upon whether you can discharge a particular patient with a minor burns 
or the patient needs admission. So any child over 10% total burn surface area or any adult with more than 15% total burn surface area always need fluid IV resuscitation. Okay. So I repeat these figures. 10 to 15% circulatory shock occurs. More than 25% remote from the area of burns, the fluid loss occurs. And any child more than 10% or any adult more than 15% should need IV fluid resuscitation. So don't, uh, don't even think of discharging the patient without giving adequate fluids. So these are the criteria for admission, acute admission to a burns unit. So everything, every point is important. We are suspecting an airway injury. Any, any patient requiring a fluid resuscitation, any patient likely to require surgery, or important burns such as hands, face, feet, or perineum, all these significant, all these are significant burns. So these burns need admission and any suspicion of non-accidental injury. So that means you have to put admission. In extremes of age, they'll be more vulnerable to shock. So admit the patient. And any patient with potential, you are, in, you are expecting some serious complications like Electrical injury, initially the patient may be fine. Later, he may go in for cardiac arrest. So those kind of patient, also hydrochloric acid injuries, chemical injuries. So any electrical injury, chemical injury, extremes of age, non-accidental, significant burns to hands, face, feet, those requiring fluids, those requiring surgery, or any airway burns. All these are mandatory. You have to put admission. So what is the immediate care? Pre-hospital itself, the treatment of the burnt, burnt patient begins. Please remember it. Not only at the hospital, even at the at the scene, at the at the place where the incident took place, you have to start the treatment once you identify it. You just stop the burns, start your ABC, airway breathing circulation, and initially cool the patient for at least three to four hours. Cool the patient for first 10 minutes. Not at ice water, please. The temperature given in daily is 15 degrees Celsius. Ice water should never be used. And provide administer oxygen and elevate the limb or elevate the burnt surface area whenever possible. So once you give, bring the patient to hospital, you start your proper A, B, C, D, E and along with that fluid resuscitation protocols. So as I mentioned, the airway burns very, very important. Early intubation is very, very critical. Because time from the burns to the airway compromise is hardly 24 hours. Initially, the patient may be fine. But if at all you notice there is a suit in the oral cavities, nasal singing and deep airway burns, if you fail to intubate, the patient will ultimately go in for a respiratory failure in 24 hours. At least early before that, before that and keep the patient on intubation at least until 48 hours. By the time which the edema and all settles. So why there is a key, the main key in the management is you should take a proper history and the early signs because it may even take 24 hours to 5 days to develop. So early intubation is the key here. So always suspect respiratory burns if you find deep burns around the mouth and neck. It is, it is, being, on, it is, it is being emphasized repeatedly in Bailey. Deep burns around the mouth as well as neck, you have to have a suspicion for respiratory burns. And if at all the patient has a, any burnt in the enclosed space or altered consciousness, you should suspect carbon monoxide poisoning. So metabolic derangement in severe burns are all except. You can share your answers in the text box. This is from Sebastian, the question. So I already mentioned you, the curling ulcers in burns arise not because of the increased HCL secretion, but only because of the lack in the mucosal defense. So, but other points are all true. Increase in corticosteroid secretion happens. There is an altered insulin metabolism, so the patient will be having a hyperglycemia, and the patient will also have a neutrophil dysfunction. So, 
So all require hospitalization except Yes. So as I already mentioned, it is 10%, not 5%. So this uh, this left side diagram is from Sebastian. Okay, we'll proceed. So there is a three zones. There are three zones. The centermost zone is a zone of coagulation. What is zone of coagulation? You just remember the tissue has going gone in for irreversible damage. So this is zone of coagulation. And an intermittent zone called zone of stasis. So what is zone of stasis? There will be vascular leakage only. There is no tissue damage that has begun. But if you, it can progress or it can deteriorate based on your fluid resuscitation. So it is like a transition zone. And last zone is a zone of hyperemia. This is where the healing begins from. So the vasodilation only is happening here. So there are three zones. The centermost zone is going in for irreversible damage. So this right-sided diagram is from Bailey. This is London Browder chart, more accurate chart for assessing the burns based on the age as well as based on the body surface concerned. So you can see in young individuals and infants, the head carries a higher percentage, which progressively decreases, 9, 8, 6, 5, 4, 3. So that is what is very important. The head carries a higher percentage in case of infants and young children. Just remember that alone. So assessment of size, a rough assessment, it's just a outside the hospital environment, you can use a Wallace rule, not within the hospital. So Wallace rule, each upper limb 9%, each lower limb 18%, torso front and back 18% each side, head and neck 9% and perineum 1%. So it only can be used as a rough guide outside the hospital environment, not within the hospital. So like next, as I told, London Browder chart only is a very useful for larger burns and inside the hospital assessment and more accurate assessment of the burn surface area also. And specifically for children, if you want to calculate, just remember the name alone. It is given as Burkos formulas for children. So head and neck in infant is 18 to 21%. Each lower limb is 14%. So this is, this is what I told. Head and neck carries a higher percentage in infants. So assessment from history and cause. Assessment from thickness. So these are the various ways by which we can assess the depth of the burnt wound. So from history and cause, the scal wounds, mostly it is going to be superficial. Whereas in the case of a young infant, the same scal wound can be very deep. So mostly scal wounds are superficial, whereas in young infants, it can be deep also. Fat burns are deep dermal. Flame burns can be mixed. Alkali burns, deep dermal. Electric contact burns, mostly they will be full thickness. This is very important. So most of it will come as a mixed dermal or deep dermal. Whereas electrical contact burns alone, sorry, they will come as a full thickness burns. And scales mostly superficial, but whereas in young infants, they are mostly deep only. So this diagram is very important, taken from both Sebastian as well as from Bailey. So we'll go one by one. The degree of burns, first degree, second degree, third degree, fourth degree. First degree, second degree, it is superficial. Third and fourth, it is deep. Superficial, it first degree is just superficial, epiderm is alone. Whereas superficial partial thickness, it is both epidermis as well as part of dermis. Which part of dermis? Just the papillary dermis. So please remember that. So epidermis dermis is second degree. Epidermis and all layers of dermis is third degree or deep partial thickness. Whereas along with the subcutaneous tissue, if it involves up to the muscle or bone depth, it comes the full thickness. So this is very important. So based on the depth or the layers involved, we are classifying. So what about the features, healing time and management? So first features, we'll remember it in an easy way. In superficial burns, there will be just erythema and pain. That's all. No other features. So there will be painful erythematous lesion in a superficial burn. No, not even blistering will be seen. 
if you find blisters it becomes a superficial partial thickness because blistering happens only when the dermis gets involved not when the epidermis gets involved so again the patient will be having severe pain there will be blistering but the the lesion will blanch on touching so there will be capillary refilling and there will be blanching to touch if there is blanching to touch on microscopic examination there won't be any fixed capillary stain you remember that all okay it is progressing now to the third degree or deep partial thickness they do not blanch also so whatever features were there in second degree it won't be there so there won't be totally blanching the sensation will be starting to reduce if you cause a pin prick the patient may have a decreased sensation because the nerves are all going to get damaged in the deep dermis so no blanching no sensation and fixed capillary staining will be present and full thickness totally anesthetized hard leathery eschar will be formed so i repeat this features alone superficial just a painful erythematous lesion superficial partial thickness pain will be there blistering will be there blanching to touch will be there whereas deep partial thickness pain will be reduced no blanching and no blistering also so no blanching to touch full thickness totally anesthetized eschar formation will be there that is all so healing what about healing superficial burns and both a uh, first degree and second degree no scar at all they will heal very well only the timing differs superficial heal within a week superficial partial thickness heal within two weeks that is all but no scar formation whereas deep partial thickness three or more weeks it can take to heal with the scar formation most commonly hypertrophic scar will be there so hypertrophic scar will be there in a deep partial thickness whereas full thickness always heal by a wound contracture very important so full thickness always heal by a wound contracture only hypertrophic scar is a finding in a tertiary thickness that is deep partial thickness so coming to management both superficial and superficial partial thickness heal on their own no need for surgery whereas deep partial thickness most often require a partial excision and grafting so whereas for eschar formation you have to do an eschatotomy or even the tissue may go in for unsalvageability you may need a graft also so this table is very important all the four degrees i have concised the important salient points you can compare and read which layer is involved in blister formation as i mentioned it is papillary dermis correct only dermis only but to be more specific it is papillary dermis so going on to fluid resuscitation i have mentioned already the lesson uh, recent atls protocol about fluid management is yes, it is c only correct so any child over 10% or any adult over 15% always need iv fluid resuscitation most commonly used solution is ringer ringer lactate whereas for burn shock saline because hypertonic saline draws extra fluid from the extra vascular compartment into the extra intravascular compartment thereby maintaining the blood pressure for the first 12 hours always avoid colloids and blood products because there will be massive leaking happening the, the vessels will be extra leaky in the first 12 hours so more the colloids you give during that period the patient will go in for more edema so that you are going to accelerate accelerate more shock to the patient so please avoid colloids and blood products so it can be asked first we'll allow us the fluid types to be avoided are colloids and blood products and as i told in children and young infants always the maintenance fluid should contain a dextrose monitoring urine output is the best and the uh, net output should be at least 0.5 to 1 ml per hour so parkland formula if at all they ask 
4 into body weight into total burnt surface area maximum of 50%, half given in the first 8 hours, remaining in the subsequent 16 hours. But this has been changed in the recent ATLS guidelines, which I have shown you in the first slide itself. So maintenance fluid in children always should contain a DNS, 100 ml per kg for 24 hours for first 10 kg, 50 ml for the next 10 kg, 20 ml for each kg over 20 kg. So this is the maintenance fluid calculation. So once again, the fluid resuscitation types compare crystalloids, colloids, free water. So each formula contains different things. As far as Parkland formula is concerned, only crystalloid administration. So colloid administration will be coming only in Brooks formula as well as in Muir and Buckley. Brooks contains both crystalloid as well as colloid along with free water administration. So all three will come under Brooks. Whereas Galvestones is for pediatric management. Once again, it's a crystalloid based formula. And Muir and Barclay, it is a purely colloid based formula. So purely crystalloid based formulas are Parkland in adults, Galveston in pediatrics. Purely colloid based formula is Muir and Barclay. And all the three comes under Brooks. You can remember like that. So purely crystalloid based, purely colloid based and combined formula. So you can't remember the formula, you can just remember what all the composite composition of each formula. So in children with burns, maintenance IV fluid is normally given in Yes, it is dextroserine, as I already stressed. The dextrose should 